Welcome to the STARS program, seniors taking active roles in society. And now, here's your host, Anita Finley. We're here. We're live. We think we're all alive. And I've got Kenny <laughs> Vance with me and also with his son, who uh, is his promoter. And, of course, his PR fantastic guy, Dave Bloom. And I forget your son's name again. Greg. Greg. Greg Vance, right? That's right. Okay, well, most important thing is, uh, Kenny, I want to talk about this with you, Kenny. I was so privileged to go to your last show. I, you know, when you came on my radio show the last time, you know, I knew of you, never had experienced you, and you're very so, so, I kept telling people about it. you're so sweet, you're so nice, and, and then when I saw you on stage, you're still sweet and very nice, but there's a big surprise. You have a son who's a musician and a singer. I could not believe this. I thought you invented someone like that. First, I thought it was just a, you know, a joke. But it wasn't. It was your son. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to let you talk, Kenny. So how did you get to have a son <laughs> like that? Well, he grew up in, in the house, and there was always music in the house. There were always instruments in the house. And so uh, it was just sort of a natural progression. And then, um, God, I, many years have gone by at this point. I've been with the Planetones. I started it in 1978 for a movie called American Hot Wax, which was the Alan Freed story. That was the original Planetones. And then I restarted the group. We took a 15-year break, and then we came back in 1992. And uh, so, what, it's almost 30, you know, it's, it's, it's a while. And uh, there was one guy that was in the group for many years, and he left the group. And there was an opening in the group, and, and my son uh, had started singing karaoke in Los Angeles. And he would go out, and he really wanted it, and he did it like a job. And every night he would go out and sing karaoke to the point where he started to get good at it. He had a, a job, but uh, this was his, was his passion. And so he pursued that. And then I looked at him and I thought, man, the guy, he's good, he can sing. And um, I said, you know, why don't we give it a try? Because he, that was, that was his dream. And it's not so simple to sing harmony, to sing group harmony. You can have a great voice, but to sing in a blend with the other guys, that, that's, the, that's the trick. And also, our idiom is an idiom that you really, it's really difficult to teach young people. For example, I'm going back to New York next uh, Thursday, and I'm working on a play, a Broadway show, which is called Looking for an Echo. Oh my goodness! And, um, it's, it's going to be directed and written by the same guy that wrote the original movie Looking for an Echo. He also wrote uh, Lords of Flatbush and discovered Sylvester Stallone and, and uh, Henry Wink, uh, Henry uh, Wink. So you have a whole new career in front of you. Well, I don't, I don't really look at it like <laughs> that, but, but the, the, the trick is, so they're auditioning young people and they get in, in Broadway now, there's a lot of young people that have been groomed ever since they're little kids to be on the Broadway sh sh a stage. And they can sing, they've taken music lessons, they've taken singing lessons. But the idiom of looking for an echo is the 50s. And so to try to get them to, to reduplicate that, if it's not in their soul, how do you, how do you translate that to them? So that's my, my job. Well, before you continue, I'm not used to seeing you without your hat on. Okay. So I need to see your hat. So your hat. you have you have this weird place you keep your hat. You don't keep it in your pants pocket. Can you see this? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, we have that now, right? We. This is a uh, a friend of mine who was a, a, a uh, an inventor, a, a equestrian. A, how do you say it? Equine. Equine. Yeah. Equine. And so uh, she saw that I used to carry this uh, hat around, and so she got me this special. Uh, <laughs> it's. I go to the perfect. airport, and the and and the TSA they go, what's in there? They think it's a hydrogen. Bomb. Right, I know. But the truth of it is, it's a it's uh, your hat. It's, it's a jockey's 
for a jockey's helmet. Ah. And so, you know, if you look carefully, it's got this little spot in there to, to uh, cup the hat. Amazing. And, uh, what did you, how did you get, for all these years, how did you keep your hat before this? Uh, Under your arm? Yeah, pretty much. You just, <laughs> carried, you just carried it. You just carried it or you put it on your head. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Okay, there you go. It's your little... Oh, yeah. That, that's your look. We got it, right? That's your look. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's great. It's a great hat. <laughs> and you have nice hair. You don't even need it. A lot of people wear... I have a cousin who doesn't have a lot of her hair is leaving, and she wears a hat all the time, but okay. you've got good hair. All right, yeah. Oh, so you don't need it, but it's okay. Okay, so now let's um, continue. So you're going to New York because you're going to be working on this show. But let's go back to your son when you were talking about harmony. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. it's hard, isn't it? But, it's hard. So also, but it, excuse me, but at the show, it was perfect. Well, because because we beat Johnny Gale and myself have you know uh, the guitar player you were talking about. Yeah. But he's more than that. He's our our, our, our musical director. We beat him up. We beat Lad up, you know, to make sure that he could, you know, sing it. And he's very tenacious. So, like, we'll give him a part, and he'll take the part. And then when we he goes back to L.A., he'll still every day. He tells me he listens to the part until he understands and he actually can uh, feel it. So, the way you know, the way we want it to be. And so when we sing, it's seamless. It is, and uh, and so he 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 has done that on his own, and um, then he also uh, you know grew up uh, when I was in Jay and the Americans, he grew up listening to all of those songs. So like those songs, he can sing, and I let I he sings Caramia in the show, and believe me, that's not an easy song to sing, and he. I think I, I haven't heard anybody sing it better than him, to be honest well, with you. Well, it was beautiful. Except for Jay Black. Well, I also want to hear about Greg, your younger son. Greg, and he's not on the mic, but Greg, uh, you can just yell out here. Do you have a voice, too, or you don't have the voice? I think he does. I'm yeah. musically inclined. Oh, he's, he's musically but inclined. But I, I <laughs> leave that to the professionals. Okay, but well, everybody he needs... He plays a, the guitar. He right? does, yeah. yeah well, and the piano. So you have just the two sons? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Okay, but you've done well, though, and they've been around you enough, you know, yeah. that they are very musical. So, okay, well, when do you think you'll be back here in Florida performing? Well, the, the uh, show at the uh, Parker Playhouse was the, the, our only show in s Southern Cal uh, Southern Florida. Florida. Oh, you're got, not going to come back soon? I don't think so. No because kidding. It wasn't that great for you? I mean, you was, like to be everywhere great. else. No, it's just that, that uh, we don't do it that much. Uh. You know, we're going to be in uh, Philadelphia this weekend on the 14th. We're at the Kes Keswick Theater. And then, let me think, we go out to Cerritos on the 19th, which is in Los Angeles. And we play there on the 21st, I believe. Then we come back here. I fly back to here. Because you live here. I you live, live here in Boynton, Boynton Beach. Beach, I know, I heard that. And then we drive across to, uh, we play in uh, Fort Myers on Thursday night. I see. At the uh, yeah, Barbara, Barbara V. Mann Performing Arts Center. Yeah, they have a beautiful place beautiful. here. Beautiful. Yeah. And then the, the, one of my favorite places is in, is in Clearwater at the Ruth Eckert Hall. Yes. So that's uh, that's a show that we've been doing ever since the 90, in the 90s. We would go there. We weren't the, the head of the bill. In those days, uh, Johnny Maestro and the Brooklyn Bridge would be the headliners of those shows. And uh, so we would just be part of those shows. And we've continued the tradition now in uh, on the West Coast. So at least you have one South Florida, and then you have the West Florida. But then you're all over, so you do New York. Do you doing other besides California? Then well, where we else? we used to do this thing unplugged, where basically, you know, I would come out with the guitar and and basically, you know, just talk about the songs and do the songs. It wasn't like a show business kind of thing. And I'm thinking there's some some nice little theaters around here. And I'm thinking that I might want to do it. There. Well, I'm very connected to the Wick Theater. I'm connected to a lot of the okay, theaters. So okay. we'll, I'll work with your wonderful Dave Bloom, 
and we'll figure out some stuff to Great. get. Yeah, yeah might, because like you, yeah, you should do that because yeah. they're always looking for extra people. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you, we've been working with Chris McDonald who does Memories of Elvis. Mm. And he does that. He's probably the best Elvis I've ever met. In fact, uh, they, they use him over there in, uh, what's it called, where Elvis's home is? I forget, the Graceland. And he's the only one they let perform there okay. on his birthday. He's fantastic. And he does, wow. let's see, he advertises with us probably twice a year because he lives here. Okay. And he does it, and he is incredible. Okay. He has a whole group and all. So, you know, there's a lot There's a lot going on here. I'm really very into all you know, this. people kind of, I think Elvis, you know, wound up being, a, 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 like, unfortunately, a caricature of himself. Yeah. But the early Elvis records are just spectacular. If you listen to those records with DJ Fontana on drums and Scotty Moore on guitar and Bill Black on bass, that trio was incredible on Sun Records and Elvis just was a magical guy. In the, in the 60s, you know, he was very nervous about that comeback on TV that he had. He came with a black jacket. Yeah. He basically sat with Ed Sullivan, right? No, no, not oh. with Ed Sullivan. They, he had a comeback where he sat on a stool and he and he hired, got these original guys back and they played. And that's a magical show. And yeah. you see Elvis as the, as the, the brilliant talent that he was. And uh, unfortunately, you know, I think yeah. that he had... He was misguided by Colonel Parker, you know, and he put him in. He was a great actor. He could have been, you know, James Dean or Marlon Brando, and he wound up, you know, putting him in these bozo movies. And, uh, you know, he, he, he probably uh, could have been so much more as a professional actor or as a serious actor. But, uh, you know, and then he gained all that weight and became the guy with the jumpsuit and... Uh, and the belts and all of that stuff and uh, it just uh, but but to see him in that show his unplugged show you see a special a special guy. oh we have some of your music being played here oh this is the duet I do with Lad oh I guess it's on loud enough I I, I guess on the radio it's being heard loud enough but, um, yeah, well, he just wanted to throw a little bit in there for that. Let me get sure. back to Elvis on one thing. I saw him at the Olympia Theater. Since I, I lived in Miami, I, I grew up oh, in Miami wow. Beach, I saw him in the late 50s when he first wow. performed there. And um, I, it was just incredible. You know, the I mean, guys I mentioned are with the, yeah. with the band. Yeah, well, and also, that's funny you should mention it because Chris McDonald did have that man that just died. He was on his show until he just died. DJ yes, uh huh. He had him doing DJ that. Fontana, yeah, exactly. So, you know, you're all like a fraternity. That's how I get yeah. the feeling. You know everybody, even though not real, you know, yeah. got close. But so this is your world. Do you yeah. dream this at night? Do you sleep and dream about all this? <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this ever since I was 13 years old. <laughs> you know, when I when I heard this music on the radio, there was a there was one disc jockey in New York that played this music, a guy named Alan Freed. He supposedly coined the term rock and roll. And he one day said that he was gonna have the first ever, the first ever rock and roll show at the Brooklyn Paramount Theater. And did he? And he did. And, and I'm sure, you know, as a promoter, they never really thought, well, you know, let's give it a try. You know, it's gonna cost us a lot of money to rent the theater. It's 10 days. We have Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, the Everly Brothers, uh, uh, Buddy Holly, the Heartbeats, the Harp Tones, the Penguins, and God. all of these, you know, the Moon Glows, all of these, the Flamingos, all of these incredible groups. And he announced it on the show, on the radio. And then when, when I said, I got to go, and I took the train up Flatbush Avenue, and when I got out, you know, in, in American Hot Wax, you sort of see what it was. And there were th thousands and thousands of people there. Every kid in the city see? came. Yeah. And we went in there, and the curtain went up, and Alan Freed was standing there, you know, in front of a 25-piece orchestra. Saxophone players laying on their backs playing. And we'd never seen anything like it. And, and we were transformed as we, when we went home, you know, and what it did was it gave 
kids their own world. Up until that time in the 50s, adults had their own world. And as kids, we were sort of not part of that. The music was music of adults. Uh, Jerry Vale. Uh, Frank Rosemary, Sinatra. Yeah. Well, well, you know, Rosemary yeah. Clooney, people right. like that. But now, all of a sudden, we had Fats Domino. We had Elvis Presley. We had Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry and Buddy Holly. And you know what? That's, that music is the prototype for all music that came after it. If you listen to, to, to Buddy Holly now, nobody ever wrote a song better than him. The Beatles studied Buddy Holly. Really? And the Everly Brothers. The See? harmony of the Beatles is the harmony of the Everly Brothers. And the song structure, George Harrison, is the, stru is the structure of Buddy Holly and Carl Perkins. As a matter of fact, when those guys went to England in the 50s, the Beatles and Keith Richards and, and Eric Clapton and all these people would, would go and they would be on TV and they would go and try to see how they held the, how they fingered the guitar and how they held the guitar. And, and because you couldn't tape it. And you know, you didn't have the, the technology that you have now. If you want to see somebody on TV, just tape it, replay it, and it's, you, know, you study what they do. But they, they couldn't believe the Everly Brothers and the strum of, uh, I don't know if it was Don or Phil, one of those guys had a, just a fantastic, you know, right hand strum on the guitar. And George Harrison, you know, picked up on that. And, and you hear his, you hear the influences the American influences on them. And then what they did, they had a lot of blues records there that came out of Chicago, because those records never made it to New York. And, but they made it to England. And Keith Richards and Brian, uh, Brian Jones from the Rolling Stones got Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf records. And basically the Rolling Stones became Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters. If you listen to 50s records of Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, you hear the early Rolling Stones. Okay, so now, who influenced you? Here you're this 13-year-old kid, yeah. you, you go and you hear this, you see it, you had friends, I mean, what made you say, hey, maybe I can do that? I know it about your guitar downstairs in the, you know, in your mom's, you know, basement, but, yeah. but the singing, how did you, who? Well, you know, I, when I went to those shows, uh, I did see Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis and people like that, but there was a group called the Heartbeats, <laughs> and there was a guy, a you name. know, I didn't know who, the, I didn't know who uh, they were, you know, the names of them until, you know, many years later. And there was a guy in the Heartbeats, the lead singer was a prolific songwriter and also was the lead singer. And his name was James Shepard. And he had just, there was something about the way he sang that, that uh, just I always loved. And over the years, I've, I've recorded a bunch of his songs. As a matter of fact, on the new CD, there's a song uh, called Daddy's Home that he had Oh, I remember Daddy's Home. Yeah, that he had a big hit with. And, uh, and um, You want to sing so? Why don't you do a little bit of Daddy's oh, Home? I love yeah. that. Yeah, and let's do that. So don't play it yet. Let's let you do it. So, so I would, uh, you know, we could, you know, you could, anyway, morph into that. But he, uh, uh, he just touched me. And I, 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 I loved imitating him, and I would take the, his records, and he did uh, You're a Thousand Miles Away, Crazy For You, oh. Our Anniversary, Daddy's Home, and just, he, 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 he's got a tremendous body of work. Of course, uh, you know, nobody knows who he is, and, and he passed away a long time ago. But you did, and that's important. Yeah. He lives in you in some way but wait I have to ask you that all right so now you want to sing where do you sing at, with your friends with your mother you know at bar mitzvahs what do you who are you singing for when you're first starting well I never I ne didn't have an audience I would go down in my mother's 
basement. Right. She had a, uh, a phonograph <laughs> thing. Right. And I, I, I would go out. In those days, you know, if you wanted to buy a 45, you went into a, a store that was the size of a closet. And you, they had these racks, and you would pull out a 45, and I would take it home. It was like a treasure. And I would take it home, and I didn't realize you had to buy a, an adapter. And so I had to center it. And a lot of times it was warped. And, and then finally I got an adapter that you put in the middle of, of the 45 and that you could play. And I would just play these records over and over and over and over again. And I discovered not only could I sing the lead, but I could sing the, the high part and I could sing the bass part. So. Uh, okay, but wait, I have to really pursue this. So now your mother's upstairs cooking, doing what she's doing, the family, yeah. and you're downstairs singing. And is she saying, what are you doing? You know, why don't you go out and get a job or why don't you do something, right? I mean, what was life like while you're first getting into this? Well, I don't think they really thought much of it. You know, I would just go down there and listen to the records. And, uh, but as time went by, I met a couple of people in the neighborhood. Now, I was 15 years old now. I was 13 at first when I got the records and when I heard Alan Freed and when I went to the show. Now I'm 15 and I, you know, I could sing and I met some kids in the neighborhood and I started to go over to their house and uh, we started, uh, there was a girl, Sadelle Sherman, she could play the piano. You remember her name, I love this. <laughs> and and uh, we, we sang and there was a guy in the neighborhood that uh, in those days, uh, he was uh, like, like they had vending machines. And so part of, of, of the vending machine world became jukeboxes. Huh. Wow. So he had jukeboxes. So these, since RCA and Columbia and and Decca and all of these record companies, the major record companies, didn't understand rock and roll. So very small, small fly-by-night companies would open up because for a couple of hundred bucks, you could make a record that could conceivably sell a million copies. So they realized that they wanted to get their records, these little small line uh, companies, so they realized that they would wanted to get their records on the jukeboxes so they would pay this guy off and he would put their records on a jukebox. So you'd go into a diner and put a quarter in and you'd hear the records. So now they wanted to get him involved with the record company. So, you know, unsavory characters and he wound up be, being part of these little record companies and he lived in my neighborhood. And we sang for him and he brought us into Manhattan. And we, we wound up in the, uh, the Ed Sullivan Theater building, which is where uh, the late night with David Letterman was. It's 1697 Broadway. It's on 54th and Broadway. It's there. And we would go in the building and there were these little record companies in, in there. And we walked in and the guy who was his partner was a guy named George David Weiss, who wrote What a Wonderful World for Louis Armstrong. And he wrote uh, Can't Help Falling in Love for Elvis Presley. He was a professional writer, but he wanted to make doo-wop records. And he had like, he, he had a, 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 like a different name. He used a different name because he didn't want to, you know, like doo-wop records in those days were, you know, were sort of like the illegitimate <laughs> son of rock and roll, of, of, of music, of the, of the professional music world. And they didn't realize in 1956 that it would, that here we are, you know, 60, 70 years later and it's still going strong. How did the word doo-wop come? I meant to ask you that. It wasn't used in the beginning, it, I think in the 70s. There were were some you know there was guys who were still holding on to this because they loved it and they had little they had record uh, radio shows and uh, do wop do wop 
doo-wop, that kind of thing was, they didn't have any money, so the background guys were imitating what horns would play. Wop. Oh my gosh. It's like, what a great story. And so, <laughs> and so, you know, that's, it wound up on these records, and then they thought, oh, it's doo-wop. That's a great story. You know, you are like an encyclopedia. We don't even have encyclopedias anymore, but you're like the encyclopedia of music. It's amazing. We have probably less than five minutes, so let's get you to sing. you got to do something on your guitar before we lose it. You're my love. You're my angel. You're the girl of my dreams. I'd like to thank you for waiting patiently daddy's home daddy's home to stay how I've waited for this moment to be by your side your best friend wrote and told me you had teardrops in your eyes. Daddy's home. Daddy's home to stay. I'm not a thousand miles away. Yay. I don't know how you've kept your voice to you. You know, we have so much to say. We never have enough time. We're going to have to do some podcasts on this stuff because you're a natural for this. Greg, yes, would you like to have a comment? Oh, you no, he can hold it. It's his, it's his friend. It's his buddy. You know, it's his girlfriend, whatever he has. It's, it's, it's very wonderful. But, you, there's so many questions I have, and I don't like to interrupt you. And I, no, well, no, it's great it, because it's, uh, the questions that you ask are, uh, are, are they get into the... Uh, they, they, they open me up and they get me thinking about the reasons behind why I did certain things. So it's a pleasure, really. I, I enjoy interacting with you. Thank much. you. Well, I'm enjoying this so much, and I know our listeners are. This is such a treasure, and, and I'm, um, I'm thrilled that you took the time I, you know, to come here and do this sure. for us, and I look forward to a lot more, you know, hopefully working with you in some other capacity. Sure, but, but it is really an honor, and uh, now, especially since I've seen your show, I mean, I kind of fell in love with you when you were here the other time and just saw what you do, but after seeing the way, whatever you said, yes, you have created something. I watched those people, damn them, wouldn't sit down, I couldn't see you. <laughs> But it was it was thrilling. And then to see the mob, I was just going to go, well, I figured you'd be sitting at a table. I couldn't get near you with the people. So what you did is you gave them back something that they, they don't want to listen to this other music. Well, they'll listen, but their kids are doing it. They wanted to go back to what you did, and you did a great job with that. So thank you very much. Yay. And uh, Kenny Vance, uh, and you've heard him. And if you want more information, uh, how could people find you? Or they could just find you on the web, I guess. Sure, I'll go KennyVance.com. KennyVance.com. Our new CD, For Your Love, is on uh, YouTube already. Really doing okay. great. Okay. Yeah. And Kenny Vance, then they could also go there and buy, buy anything they needed from you yeah, also, sure. right? And I want them to hear Lad, and, you know, I wish they could meet Greg because he's so sweet, too. And yeah. You have, you've done a good job, and I, I'm going to end it with... I don't know if you've had any plastic surgery, but you've got a great skin, great face, and you look good. Good. So it's whatever, see, because your passion is keeping you what you are. Exactly. You know that. I know exactly. that. Okay, everybody. We'll be back next Saturday. Be well. Don't get, uh, don't get any of the viruses. Please just hide under the bed. Bye. <laughs>